aspects, therefore the answer will bear two aspects. Firstly is the physical one. When can I go? Well, obviously, according to the verse, it says when you're able to go. So the first thing being, for example, my physical state. Am I healthy? Yeah, I'm healthy. I check that box. I can move on. What's the next one? Let's have people who are dependent upon me. If I'm married, my wife, my children. Sometimes even your parents can be dependent upon you. Someone's mother may need them continuously to take them around. So if someone's dependent on you and you know that when you go for Hajj, they won't be safe, they won't have security, they won't be stable, then you can't go for Hajj. But let's say no one's dependent upon me, I can check that box as well. Then it comes on to finance. Do I need, do I have the money? Yes, I have the money. 2K, 2.5K this year, I can go for Hajj. But then the questions start creeping up. What if I have a loan? Let's say I've got a mortgage on my house, can I still go for Hajj? Well, the mortgage has certain terms. For example, I need to pay a certain percentage back every month. Let's say that comes to a thousand pounds, two thousand pounds a month. So long as I can continue to abide by those terms, I can continue to pay my mortgage every month, then with the rest of the money, I'm free to go for height. What if I have a soft loan? I have a loan from someone who's not charging me interest, let's say a relative. It was a cash injection into my business. He tells me, you pay me back whenever you can. If that's the requirement, if that's the term, pay me back whenever you can, then I can still go for Hajj because he doesn't need the money right away. But let's say he tells me, no, pay me back as soon as you start getting a profit. That means with any profit which comes in, I've got to pay him back first before I can go for Hajj. Now a question which is more related to students, what about my student loan? Depending on what you're studying, you have a 10K student loan, 15K, 40K, and it just keeps on going higher, right? So I've got a student loan, can I still go for Hajj? Well, when we signed the student loan papers, if you remember, there was a prerequisite to paying back. You have to earn over 15k, then you have to start paying back. If you don't earn over the threshold of 15,000, you don't need to pay back. So, so long as I'm earning under that threshold, I can still go for heights with my savings. What if I'm earning over that threshold? Well, if you are earning over the threshold, you'll know that the check, by the time it comes to you at the end of the month, they already start paying your student loan for you. So even with that money, you can still start going for heights. So the finance side is covered. I'm physical, no one's dependent on me, I've got the money, I can go for Hajj. But there's another aspect. The finance and the physical side isn't the greatest of our worries for going to Hajj. You know what the greatest worry of ours is for going to Hajj? The greatest worry is whether you and I have been invited for the Hajj. How many of you know people who have the money, who have health, who don't have anyone dependent upon them, but still they're not able to go for Hajj. People who give their passports in for the visa, they get it back stamped with the visa just before they leave bereavement. They can't go for Hajj. People who give their passports in, visa rejected. People who give their passports in, they find that there's not enough pages in the passport. People who want to go for Hajj, just things don't happen. Why? That's because we haven't been invited for Hajj. So the first thing when we answer that question, when should I go for Hajj? The first answer is when I'm invited for Hajj. Yes, if we look at it at a superficial level, it's me who's accumulating my wealth. It's me who's making sure the people who are dependent upon me are safe. But in reality, it's not me, it's Allah. If He's the one who gives me the wealth, He's the one who's going to look after my family, He's the one who's going to ensure that I meet all these requirements, then it's Him. So the first and foremost prerequisite for going to Hajj is that I get that invitation to go for Hajj. The invitation from Allah. Why? Why is this journey so special that I need an invitation to, from Allah? It's no ordinary journey. I could be the closest person to you. I could sit at your doorstep for hours. But so long as you don't open that door and invite me in, there's no way I can enter your house. It's the same with Allah. You can try your best. I can try my best. He can try his best. She can try her best. But so long as Allah doesn't open the door to us, so long as Allah doesn't invite you and me, there's no way you're going to be going on this journey of Hajj. This journey of Hajj requires people who are worthy of being invited for Hajj. When somebody is worthy of it, then the invitation is sent to them. And it's not a journey of fear. Some people feel that when I go for Hajj, the main thing is forgiveness. I need it's a journey of fear and I'm going to my Creator. It's not a journey of fear and it can't be a journey of fear. If it was a journey of fear, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have guaranteed forgiveness for each and every one who goes for Hajj. 
It's not a journey of fear. Imam Ali says in the tradition, he says, those who go to Mecca for obligatory and voluntary pilgrimage are the guests of Allah. And his gift to them is forgiveness. His gift to you and me when we go for Hajj is forgiveness. It's like, remember when we were young, we go to these birthday parties, at the end of the party you get a gift bag, right? Everybody gets a gift bag. It doesn't matter your party bag, right? It doesn't matter if you sleep at that party or you're active in that party. Whatever happens, you're getting that gift bag at the end, so long as you don't do something really absurd and go against the rules. Same with Hajj. You have certain rules, easy to abide by. So long as you abide by those rules, your party bag, Allah says, is, is forgiveness. Don't worry about forgiveness. Hajj is something else. Hajj is something greater. It's something special. If it's not a journey of fear, then what is it? The only other answer is that Hajj is a journey of love. A journey of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a journey where this servant humbles himself to such a state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him and makes him taste the sweetness that is not tasted otherwise. Physically, he's stripped of his identity. Completely. Now he's only walking around with a few pieces of cloth around him. Physically, he's made to sweat for that sweetness. He's made to earn that, that sweetness. He has to run between Safa and Marwa. He has to do that tawaf. He has to sleep in these camps, in these tents. Then only can he taste that sweetness. Internally, he's also challenged. That man who, or that woman who was a racist, now they're brushing shoulders with people of all races. That person who thought that they had a status in society due to their wealth, well now there's no difference between them and those other people who may not have the same amount of wealth when they're doing the tawaf. Before it was that car that showed the man's prestige in society, or well, there's no car today, it's only two pieces of cloth, and everyone wears the same cloth. Everybody does the same action. There's no you and me night. Now, that Inus has also been taken away. So Allah takes us on this journey of love through certain actions that you know about. These actions are obligatory on each and every one of us. And as Sadiq says, in a beautiful tradition, he says, Almighty, Allah Almighty and Exalted says, مَا تَحَبَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِأَحَبِّ مِمَّا افْتَرَثْتُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the servant endears himself to me by no better means than that which I have made obligatory upon him. It's just a wajib action that somebody has to do to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these hujjaj, now they've been forgiven. Now they've been stripped off of their identity and now they're lowly, humble servants in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now comes the pinnacle of the journey, the tawaf, the circumambulating of the Kaaba. In this, everybody loses their highness. There's no individualism here. Everybody's losing their highness and everyone's now lost in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're doing tawaf, you know, it's, we're told that you should try and be as close to the Kaaba as possible. It's mustahab. The closer you are to the Kaaba, the better it is. However, you can't touch it. Be as close as you can, but don't touch it. It's the same in this life, in this worldly life. We can try as hard as we can, and so we should be, to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you'll never meet Him. You'll never touch Him. You'll never go face to face with Him in His entirety, in your entirety. And that's the sweetness of love. For those of you who are married, you'll know that the engagement time, it has a different love. That fire which is there in the engagement time is not there in the marriage. It's a different type of love. Why? Because the engagement time, you haven't met. There's something that you're looking forward to. Once you meet, then everything's taken place. It's a different type of love. When your wife, when your husband goes away on a journey, you're eager. That love all of a sudden increases because you haven't met them. You're waiting to meet them now. That's why that sweetness is there. That's what's so beautiful. That's the driving force in our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The driving force of yearning to meet Him. And it continues and continues. Why? Because I'm finite and He's infinite. And the road from the finite to the infinite has to be infinite. I'll never meet Him. That means that determination, that want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be continuous. Then again in the tawaf, where they're circumambulating the Kaaba, 